All right. Welcome. Developing SharePoint solutions using business connectivity services. You guys excited? Yeah. Woo! I love coming to LA for a couple of reasons. I'm from Seattle. I love coming to LA. There's sun down here, and there's a professional basketball team. So it's nice. And of course, I'm going to go home without a laptop. How exciting is that? You guys get a laptop? Everybody get your laptop? Seven million people on the internet are going, why didn't I go to PDC? We're going to talk about BCS. Uh, Kurt Del Benny mentioned it this morning in his keynote. Uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, interesting in that BCS cuts across SharePoint to client. We're going to focus as much as possible on SharePoint. Obviously, that's one of the, the centers of gravity. Uh, my name is Steve Fox. I'm a technical evangelist up in Microsoft. My alias, STEFOX, feel free to follow up with me after today's session. Uh, and my, my blog is, uh, is right there as well. Any code you see today, I'll post up on my blog. Uh, the only one, my final demo, it's not quite done yet, so we can't post that just yet. But if you want to see that code, you can ping me offline, and I'll get you an unfinished zipped copy of it. Uh, the outline for today, I'm going to give you a general overview. I don't want to spend too much time at that level. I think I just want to give you enough for, so you all understand what this thing called BCS is, give you a high-level architecture. And then we'll kind of dig into developing a solution using BCS. And I'll walk you through four components. I mean, you're here, you're developers. You're all developers, right, most of you? <laughs> Yay, we're sick and tired of putting our hands up. Yeah, so uh, basically this is aimed at the 300 level developer talk, and I'll walk you through the how, okay? We'll talk a bit about deployment and security, wrap up the hour with a summary and hopefully uh, some time for Q&A. Uh, goals, what is BCS and why we use it? Who cares is basically you know, answering that question. Understand how BCS rationalizes against the SharePoint server and the client and then talk a bit about how we build solutions using the BCS. Now, in the spirit of uh, PDC, I wanted to talk a bit about timeline, right? Because PDC is traditionally about what's coming in the future. And as you know, today, Beta 2 got announced. So we're kind of at ground zero in respect to getting your hands on the bits for Office and SharePoint. But looking forward, you could think of six months out. Somewhere around there, you'll see RTM, more or less, time frame. And then we have this thing called Duet. That was announced again this morning. You could think of that being further out, uh, 12 to 18 months. I won't talk too much about Duet other than to say that there is a connection there with BCS. It's exciting in that it, it provides that connector into SAP. But uh, just kind of in the spirit of, of uh, showing a timeline as to where does this fit on this PDC scale, that's essentially what we're looking at here. OK, so overview. What's the problem? The problem is twofold when we think about the, uh, the idea of, of building solutions that leverage BCS. And the problem is the fact that a lot of companies are investing in these back-end systems. They invest in SAP, they invest in Siebel, they invest in other types of uh, systems that manage your business. In some cases, it's millions of dollars, a lot of money. And so really what ends up happening is you get specialists within a company who are actually interacting with that back-end system, and not everybody has access to that data. And oftentimes what happens is that data is critical or it could be used for a very good purpose for a certain degree of those information workers. So you want to get that data out of those back-end systems and expose it into the information worker experience. And invariably what we're talking about here is managing multiple user interfaces, right? We're talking about these external systems that might be difficult. For those of you who have used SAP before, you know it's got a very specific GUI. And so you have to have a little bit of a training to navigate your way into a particular BAPI or business object inside SAP, and so on and so forth. The point is we want to be able to bridge that results gap. And results gap is basically saying, take the external data and expose it out to the right people. That, in sum, is the problem. There's another side of the problem, though, that's IT. So think about this. If we have multiple tools that we're building, and this happens a lot, People get creative, they build these little tools, all of a sudden that spins up into an effort, someone has to support that. Someone has to use that. You're asking information workers to context switch across these different tools. So invariably what happens is where you could have one user experience that's streamlined or centralized within a common experience, what you end up getting is multiple tools that you invariably have to support as an IT organization, as developers, admins, and so on and so forth. And I think really what you want to do is mitigate that problem. Again, you want this streamlined approach to getting that data out 
and getting it into the purview of the information worker. And this is basically just saying, hey, this simply defined, BCS is taking that data and putting it in SharePoint or putting it in Office. That's what BCS enables. Now, how many people here actually used the business data catalog in 2007? So you're all pretty familiar with the application definition files, the BDC definition editor, all that stuff, right? That's actually a really good base. If you're coming into here and saying, I understand that world, that's a good base to have because basically the BCS could be thought of as the evolution of the BDC with more operations. And if that doesn't make sense, it will make sense as we go throughout this presentation. So simply define just a way to, to hook up external data sources to SharePoint or to Office Client. Now, let's start digging underneath the covers here. What does that look like in a practical architecture? When we think about that, we have a couple of entry points. From the SharePoint perspective, we have Silverlight applications, and you saw a bit of that you know, from Scott Goo's presentation, and you saw some of that from the, uh, the race car prototype presentation we had today, which was all about Silverlight, bringing BCS data from SQL Azure, pulling that into a Silverlight app and dropping that into SharePoint. We had just visual web parts or web parts, custom web parts, or this thing called external list. If you haven't heard of this, I'll show you what that is today. It's nice, it's a new feature within SharePoint 2010. And there's other artifacts that you can build within SharePoint. Popping over to the Office Client though, what can we do when we have uh, we Office Client? We have this thing called an add-in that we can build in different Office applications. We have dock level solutions. And basically an add-in or a dock level solution is just saying if I want to build a custom template and I want that data to be associated with that particular template, I would build this thing called a dock level solution. And there's other things within that world that you can leverage as a developer, right? You can leverage OpenXML, you can leverage .NET, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll show you a couple of those today. Interestingly, I'll show you an example today where we actually go and build a simple .NET Win form app that you can obviously extrapolate into WPF. But the point is, it's a Win form app that also integrates with the external lists using the client object model. So there's multiple APIs that you can use as a developer to get at this external list. And again, we'll talk about that as we go through. I really wanted to make this a structured approach, moving from the data source to the presentation, and then with a nice kind of uh, demo that pulls it all together at the end. So second layer down, services. If I was going to connect with SAP today, what would I do? And I pick on SAP because that's really a large degree of business out there is being driven from SAP. So I could build an ASMX service. I could build a WCF service or leverage the BizTalk adapters. Or I have this thing called BCS, and the next slide actually drills into that architecture, so hang tight on that one. And of course, ADO.NET doesn't really apply to, to SAP or other types of business systems, but I put it there just in case you do want to integrate with uh, SQL Server. Because what's happening is we're seeing a lot of aggregated data sources coming together. As a developer, you have to bring those together into one streamlined experience. You can't have a user kind of bouncing out to all these different experiences, you have to kind of bring them together. And to the user, they shouldn't recognize multiple data sources coming together. It should just be one experience that's designed around that aggregation. And of course, at the bottom here, this is where we're kind of pulling this stuff up from these external data systems. We have Dynamics, Siebel, SAP, PeopleSoft, Oracle. And of course, within each of these different companies, they're going to have different products, right? eOracle Business Suite might be one that targets a specific market, SAP, targets ERP, but they're all typically going to have the facility where you're actually building a web service to grab that data. So invariably, we're talking about a service-based application on that back end to grab that data. That's OK, OK? That's totally OK. Now, if we, uh, uh, one thing before I go and talk a little bit about the BCS, this is where Duet will come into play as we move forward. Duet will have an extensibility model, and basically what we say is BCS can actually integrate with a service. So just like you did in BDC in 2007, and you built an ADO.NET or a web service ADF, an application definition file, same thing persists forward. You have those two levels of support. In the context of Duet, it's basically a BCS can plug into those adapters, which will directly plug into SAP. So basically what that means is you as a developer, you have some out-of-the-box adapters that you'll be able to plug into SAP, okay? That said, underneath the covers again, and I realize this may be a bit hazy for the people in the back, I will post these slides today on my blog so you'll have access to them, okay? But if we drill into BCS, let's look at it from two perspectives, the SharePoint perspective and the client perspective. If we look at the SharePoint site, or the SharePoint perspective, you can see that we have this thing called an external content type. 
Very, very important concept when we think about this thing called BCS. Essentially what that means, remember this schema that you built, the ADF in 2007? The ECT, that's what we're calling it in 2010. And the reason being it's acting more like a content type. We have tools, we have an OM, right? We have services. So it's a little more rich than just a schema. But at its essence, it still is just a schema that defines that relationship between your entry point and either SharePoint or the client or that back-end external data system. And as we move up the SharePoint data side, or the SharePoint side, you can see we have this thing called external list. You can see we have search and workflow and web parts. And again, just like we had BDC in 2007 that facilitated index search from our line of business systems, B BCS does the similar thing, okay? But this external list is pretty exciting because basically what we can do is we can create a read-write relationship with our back-end data sources now very quickly and easily. And you'll see me do this in SharePoint Designer, and I understand that not all pro devs want to get in there and use SharePoint Designer, but I think you know SharePoint Designer in 2010 is an interesting tool. It's free, so really in reality, you probably want to have it as a part of your toolkit anyways. And then as we move over to the client side, we have this thing called VSTO package, and what that means is I create an external list. I can take that list offline. I can deploy it on the client, and what that does, it takes a snapshot of that data creates a client-side data cache. It has an OM there that's actually installed as part of Office Professional Plus. And then I can actually code against that client-side data cache. Now here's the nice thing. We now have an offline story for this thing called an Office Business Application, which is essentially, if you built a web service against SAP before, you kind of had constant connectivity, right? But if we did it now using BCS, we can have it offline and we have this listener service, this BCS sync at the bottom there. And basically what that does, it runs through and it says, hey, when there's an update, make sure you put it on the queue and update that backend system. So basically you've got this fairly symmetrical relationship between the client and the server that you can take offline. So in essence, it's pretty interesting from a, in, from a developer's perspective and from a business perspective. And so I think, I'm gonna stop there because there's lots of boxes here and we could go into depth here, but again, this at the bottom that just reiterates the fact that this is pointing down towards external systems. They could be ADO.net, they could be a service, they could be very specific services that you've built against your system, okay? So, what I wanna do, I wanna spend the bulk of the time walking through, basically, a process. This process is gonna have four essential ingredients, okay? The first one's gonna be the external data source. We're gonna take a look at this simple data source that I built, but it's gonna be web service mediated, all right? I wanted to inject even a little bit of realism into my demo because invariably you are going to be building a service that's gonna be reacting against a backend data source in some manner. Then I have my external content type. This is my schema. This is the evolved application definition file that we'll build, all right? And we'll take a look at this from the perspective of SharePoint Designer. We'll also take a look at building this from the perspective of Visual Studio. You have your options, okay? Third, the external list. This is kind of the artifact that will result from using SharePoint Designer to build out and consume this ECT. That's gonna create a connection to our backend data store. And of course, then we have the ability to consume the APIs. So what this means is I can create, you know, external lists fairly simply, right? But then you wanna get into coding. You wanna create rich applications. You wanna create WPF-based applications that read or write that external list. Invariably, you're writing back into that external data source, but you wanna be able to use different APIs. So we'll talk about the different ways in which you can do that as well. And so taking these four essential ingredients and creating a process, this is what I wanna walk through. I've got four or five demos where I'm gonna walk through each of these areas. And the first one we'll walk through is taking a look at the external data. And then we'll go to ECT, we'll offline an external list, we'll create an external list, then we'll show a couple of examples where we have APIs, okay? So external data source, you guys still excited? Woo, come on! All right, let's try to warm you up here. Okay, so, no input signal. All right, so this is my SharePoint site, this is my environment. Um, basically what I'm gonna show you first of all is um, a couple services or a couple of methods that I've built. So basically I went through and I built a web service that is going to very simply put, do a get and a put into this backend system. This is my, you know, phantom backend system. It's really pathetic, it's AdventureWorks. But the point is being a little more realistic, there's a service there. 
And when you're creating a service against this backend system, invariably there's going to be some sort of method that you're kind of putting there in between that backend system, especially if we think about SAP. The thing is what you'll do is you'll go into SAP, you'll go through the wizard, you'll create your service that interacts with your BAPI, and when you have your service, that's what you're exposing out, right? So imagine this is the process of me being an ABAP coder. I'm going through creating that service to my backend API or my, my uh, object in SAP, and of course uh, resulting in a couple of different web methods. So you can see here that what I've got, I showed you my entity data model, which is very simply just one table. And I've got this AdventureWorks entities. You can see I've got a list collection here, list customers. Now list customers is, is basically an MRA object, and this is my custom object. I've got a number of properties. You know, customer ID, first name, last name. And simply put, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to grab some data from my backend system. I'm going to spin through and I'm populate a list collection of objects. So I'm just going to fill some properties on that object, right? It makes perfect sense, right? Eventually, what I'm going to result in, if you take a look, we go back to our service and I'll pull some code in. Here we go. Wasn't that fun? And what we're going to do is we're going to grab 100 records. That's my filter. I'm just going to set my customer ID to nothing. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the application definition files and some of the stereotype uh, operations you can build on those, what I'm doing is I'm just creating a finder. This is just going to go out and basically do a select all, given the parameter of 100. And you can see here, let's go ahead and just view full screen. You can see here, I'm creating this uh, return data object that's going to go in. My customer data is basically my entity data model. It's going to go through grab some data, and for each of those records that I'm pulling back, I'm populating this temp customer, populating the uh, properties of this, and then I'm adding each one of those to my, basically my uh, list collection, which I'm going to return, okay? So nothing too new here in terms of the, uh, the web service stuff. This is pretty standard stuff, and you might uh, invariably do something similar if you're building again against SAP. It's basically a get or a read. Something similar. If we're going to take a look, take a look at the update, because this is the other web method I'm building, basically what I've got here is I've got this return string. So we'll go ahead and we'll just uh, full screen. And again, I'll put this code up on, uh, on my blog a little later on if you can't read this. But basically, I've got some parameters this time. Coming in, I'm calling my update method, passing those parameters in. We're teeing up off the customer ID. All right, that's our identifier. And what's going to be returned is a string right, with the fact that we've got this save changes where we're taking our, our context object and we're actually updating it using the parameters that I'm passing in to my update customer data, okay? Simply put, that's my get and that's my put, okay? Now, in terms of deployment, how have I deployed this guy? Basically, if you go into IIS, I deployed this, I prefer, I know that in, in uh, SharePoint 2007, people like to deploy stuff into the Hive. I actually prefer to deploy my stuff in IIS. Just keeps it there, it's separate. In case there's an update on SharePoint, you might you know, overwrite your existing services, but this is just a preference of mine. So I go in here into my website that I created. You can see if I go into content view, I can go into my service, I can browse to my service, and you'll see that this should invoke my service. I go get customers, I'm gonna leave it blank, that's just gonna go and get those 100 records for me, and there's my 100 records. Now, to prove that actually this is actually talking to a backend data source, I'll go update my customer, uh, my update customer data, and I'll just say Steve James 425-999-8880, okay? Email address is steve at acme.com, and we'll say email promotion is two. I'll invoke that, it'll update, and so when we go back and actually call the get customers operation again and just invoke it. You can see that at this point, I don't know if you can see that, hopefully you can, but it's updated. So the point is we have a working service that's actually interacting with a backend data source at this point, okay? The extrapolation for you is that you may build a similar web service, but your backend data source may be different, okay? Now, let's jump back to the slides for just a sec. Now you see the backend data source. The next thing we want to do is once we have our external data, which we've seen, we want to build this thing called an external content type, okay? Now essentially you could think of the external content type as the building block, right? This is where we have our external system. We have to build this schema, 
this lovely XML file that I know you all love to code when you're building these application definition files, right? You loved it, right? Woo! Who hand coded the application definition files? You guys are diehards, man. Awesome. Probably a, a number of you use the business data catalog definition editor, right? That shipped with the SDK. That was another way of doing our metadata or MetaMan, whatever the other tool was. MetaMan, yeah, that was another tool. Um, so anyways, so basically you'll do something similar here except you use SharePoint Designer VS 2010. So here we have this thing called an external content type. It's using a lot of the same elements and the, the kind of structure and the taxonomy of that schema that you have known before. What's different though is you'll have additional operations that you would build. So for example, you look at my services, I have a get and I have a put. If I tried to build that in 2007, I couldn't articulate that with, to support that put. I can only articulate a get. So the point is what we're doing now is we're trying to add these additional operations which basically allow us to build CRUD operations against our external data source. All right? So we go here, external content type. Now here's where we get into, hey, I can build this for SharePoint or I can offline that for the client and I can code against either of these and everybody's happy, okay? But again, it's this ECT, this schema file that kind of lies at the heart of creating that relationship with that backend data source, all right? This is a <laughs> somewhat useless, I think, the grander scheme of things for the people at the back. But this is basically just an example of um, a simple web service based schema. In fact, what I'll do is we'll build it out, we'll offline it, and I'll actually open it up so you can actually see. But again, for those of you who built this before, this is going to seem pretty familiar. And this is the external list that we'll actually build. So let's go ahead, let's jump back into our demo environment, okay? And what we're going to do now is we're going to actually do some new stuff. Okay, we got the web service. Let's kill this. You've seen that. Let's kill this. We know where that lives. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to go into SharePoint Designer. So I'll do SharePoint Designer first. We'll open up Edit Site in SharePoint Designer. That immediately creates a connection with, Share, uh, with our SharePoint site. And when we're in here, we have this thing called external content types. I click on external content types. Basically what's going on is SharePoint Designer, this XML file, basically when you create it, it actually pushes it down into this thing called the metadata store within SharePoint. So it allows you to create and deploy that XML file. Remember you imported that file before? It kind of does that thing for you, right, the import. So these are all the uh, external content types that I have to date in my metadata store on my SharePoint demo site. If I want to build a new one, I go ahead here and click external content type. You can see that creates uh, a little wizard here. I can add in, let's say, PDC test six. I think that's what I'm on here, I'm not sure. And we go through this process of filling in some properties. Now here, office item type, when I offline this list, you're gonna see me open it up in Outlook. At this point here, what I'm saying is, I really do wanna offline that and I wanna map it to the content or the contact office properties. It'll be a little more evident as we walk through the wizard what that means, but what I'm doing is I'm setting up my data source that comes from an external list to be mapped to Outlook properties. So it's a nice way of actually creating that relationship on the client with your backend data source. I'll leave it as enabled. I'll click here to discover uh, different data sources. You can see that I've already got some in here. But let's say I wanted to add a connection, and I'll actually just show you this. Let's go back to IS just for a second here and open this up. Because uh, there's actually a little bug in here in beta 2, and I want to show you this bug. Because I think it's on my blog, but I just want to show you while we're here. I'm going to browse to my service. Uh, I go here and pick this up. If I go back into here, you can add different types of external data sources. So I can add a .NET type, which is basically just a, a custom object that I can create in .NET. I can add a SQL server, which is an ADO.NET connection, or I can add this thing called WCF service. This is misnamed, and I think it's a bug in beta 2. It should change by RTM. I think it's going to become web service, because basically that supports both WCF and it supports uh, ASMX. So if you go into WCF, since we're talking about services here, and click OK, this creates, or this spawns, this WCF connection. Now there's a couple things here we need to do. We need to go here, but guess what? This doesn't support local host, okay? So I actually have to explicitly enter in the name of my uh, server. So I think it's BCS demo VM server. The other thing you need to remember is at the end of this guy, question mark, 
uh, question mark, was done. Okay? So at that point, you'll be able to, uh, it should be able to connect. We'll go back here. Uh, BCS demo VM server. I think that's right. Click at a name, test. And at this point, I'm going to leave everything else and just basically use my user's identity. That will go. It'll find that web service that I just created and actually build this, uh, begin to build this external content type, this data connection. So here's my test. You can see that it's gone out. You've got, I've got two web methods that it's, it's basically read. You can see here all the parameters that I've created. Now at this point, what I'm going to do is go and go through the process of actually creating operations. Now, two fundamental operations have to be associated with a given ECT, read item and read list. Fundamentally, that's what you need. Those are the baseline operations that you need. So we can go through and say, I'm going to create a read item here for my get customers. I'm not going to go through the whole process. I'll, I'll bounce back and show you a built one. But I do want to walk you through this because it's a little different from the ADO.NET experience. So basically, I have my customer ID. Let's just make sure that says customer ID. We'll go ahead and take that. We'll map to the identifier. In here, where you see custom property, this is where those Outlook properties are exposed. So remember I said I want to map it to a contact? Well, SharePoint designer is saying, well, hey, all this external data stuff, this external data source, these are the, the potential properties that you could map that to. So I can go down here and say, OK, I have a first name parameter. I want to map that down to first name. I want to go over here to last name, and I want to map that to, let's say, last name. And where's last name? There it is. And so on and so forth. Let's say customer ID. That has to be mapped back to customer ID. And so on and so forth. And, and you should really go through and map any ones that you can. You won't be able to map every single one because there'll be custom properties. That can, you can just leave those. Outlook will understand. I'll get to you. Outlook will understand what to do. And then we click Finish. And you can see now we have a read item. Now, that's, we're not done. We have to create a read list. And then we go through the same process of creating this operation, which again, we're just going to go through this process. Next, customer ID, map to identifier. We'll just show something in the picker just to get through, and we'll say finish. And at this point, we just have a read-only ECT that's going to allow us to read my service data. So it's going to call that get customers web method my service this connection. So I just click Save. Ah, that's not good. Where'd it go? Uh, external content types. Or it's PDC test two. And I think I lost it. But basically, I just save. And then I click custom, uh, create a custom list. And basically, what happens is something similar to this. It, uh, SharePoint Designer automatically creates a list for us in SharePoint. And what's happening now is we have this relationship with this backend data source. Now, the thing is, in SharePoint, this data is not stored in SharePoint. SharePoint is just exposing it through, uh, for us through this ECT. OK? And you can see here that in this one, I've built a, a read-write relationship. So I've created a relationship. I've got the get and the put enabled on this ECT. I can view the item, or I can edit the item. And the interesting thing here is you can build your custom forms in SharePoint, and you can expose this uh, custom template here. I can change this. And it's basically going uh, to update my backend data source from within SharePoint. So this is a really interesting innovation in the context of SharePoint 2010. For those of you who are building this stuff in the, in the BDC 2007, you couldn't do this. You really couldn't do this. So I think this is a huge advancement, especially when you think about tying this into all these different data sources. Because I'm just showing you a pretty flat list here. But you can do some other stuff, as we'll see. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is basically, let's go into uh, VS, and I'll show you the project template. Um, so if we go into VS and create File, New, Project, there is a business data connectivity model. This is basically where you can actually create um, a VS-based BDC model. Now, if you're, I don't know if you caught this with SharePoint Designer. Basically, we were going through, and you're creating an external content list. You had some of the stuff kind of automatically created for you. First of all, you're not in source control, right? Second of all, you're not able to kind of build multiple web service and tie that to that BDC entity model. You can actually do that within Visual Studio. And when we create, let's go test PDC 7. We'll go OK. You can see here we could add that to source control. At this point, we can click Finish. That will stub out a project for us. And the nice thing about the BDC template, here is the entity. 
Remember I told you it comes with two fundamental operations, read list, read item. There are those operations. There's actually some code spit behind the scenes. So if we go back into the BDC model, you can see that here's our entity that's defined. It's defined very simply with an identifier and a message. So you can actually build this and deploy it, and it will do some stuff. And if we go into the service file, this is where we're actually doing some other stuff. We're, we're creating a read item and a read list. We could actually update this uh, to change. But let's do something here. Let's actually build and deploy as is. Because I actually want to show you a couple of features with the, the SharePoint. This is actually really cool. So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm actually building and deploying into my SharePoint site. It's recycling the IS application, adding the solution, et cetera, et cetera. And when I go back into, after successful, there we go, go back into here, I'll go back home, navigate back up, and I go into all site content. This time what I'm gonna do, the, the VS project doesn't actually create the list for me. I actually have to go explicitly create that external list and then map it. Because what happens, VS doesn't drop that XML file into the metadata store, it creates a feature. And this is really nice, right? If you want to build other objects or artifacts and drop them into SharePoint using the VS project template, it's very, very powerful. You could, you could map out multiple web services. You could have web parts, visual web parts that consume that entity. You can do all sorts of really interesting stuff with that project template. And here we go. I go into create. I'll hit list. I'll go down to external list. There, click create. And we'll just say my new PDC list from yes, and we'll go here. That will actually go into all of the deployed ECTs that we have that we can basically associate with this particular list, this external list, and then we'll click create, and that should fundamentally, hopefully, create the, uh, the site. And then I'll just make one change um, and redeploy it to kind of prove out, here we go, where was that one? Uh, there it is right there, click OK. Click Create. And this should build out. Basically, what this is going to do, it's going to build out a list with just a couple things. Now, I'm going to try something here that's pretty cool. I'm going to go back up here. And let's do something a little different here. We're going to uh, get rid of this. We've got an entity. So let's just create a list collection uh, of, um, let me see here, of entity one. OK? We'll call this entity list as well. We'll say new entity. And what we'll do is we will say um, uh, entity one, um, entity one, one. And we'll just set entity uh, one dot identifier equals zero, and entity one dot message equals, actually, is that the right type? Uh, I believe it is. Let's just go back and make sure. Yep, we're good. And all I'm going to do here is say uh, change, return entity list, and I think we have to change this to list to make sure that actually responds. The nice thing is here we'll redeploy. And I go back to my site, and hopefully this will work, because I haven't really tested this. Hopefully this will work. And what happens is as opposed to re-enabling that connection by bringing up that external list and mapping it back to the external content type, when my new change actually deploys, you can see you're still adding the solution. It's going through the process, deploy succeeded. I should be able to just click on this list, press F5, to refresh the page, and hopefully this will expose a new data structure. If not, you'll get this error that says, ah, I don't understand what you're trying to do. And typically what that means, you've got a, a definition problem with your entity definition. But hopefully this should work. Any questions while this is building? Yeah? Can you map image, image fields? Can you map image fields? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'll find out for you, though, and I'll post it on my blog. Uh, so here you go, I redeployed. Now, the nice thing is, I don't know if you noticed this, I had my connection intact. I redeployed. I didn't have to do anything to the list. It just got updated. So basically, Visual Studio now knows 
what to do when you're deploying and redeploying and retracting solutions into SharePoint. And one thing I could do here is basically go back and retract this guy, and it'll retract the solution, retract succeeded, and lo and behold, what's gonna happen if I try and refresh? Basically what's happened is Visual Studio has pulled this off of the server, off of SharePoint, and I should get an error now because my ECT as a feature has been pulled off. That is huge, right? Huge. Remember how many times you had to go in and find the GUID and delete the feature and, le, 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 and pull your hair out and there we go, right? So just in terms of developer productivity, I think you're gonna find some serious advancements with Visual Studio, okay? So, yeah? So uh, if I understand you correctly, the question is, could I preset my definition or my connection and continue to use that? I think the answer is yes, although I haven't tried it, but I believe the answer would be yes, that you could leverage it. And I think what you would do is you create it in your structure, your VS structure, and just leverage it. And I think what we'll do is in my final demo, I'll actually show you the connection that I've set up there. Uh, so let's jump back to slides, your favorite. So, so far, just to recap, okay? I wanna keep us on, prog on, on uh, on the track here, external data. We saw the web services, two web methods, or the web service of two web methods. It updates, we know that. We created the external content type. Uh, you saw the external list. One thing I actually didn't show you though, that I will show you, is basically when you have your list, this is super important. So remember I told you you create this VSTO package and you offline it to your client? When this loads, basically what we do is we go list, we have this connect to and go list setting where we have sync to SharePoint workspace or connect to Outlook. This is basically what we do is we take that list and it's packaging it up right now and it's gonna deploy it out to our client so we can then consume that client side data cache, okay? So we install it, it says, okay, it's gonna take a couple minutes, there we go, successfully updated. And then what we can do is we can open up Outlook and you can see that down here we have these different external lists. There's the one we created and what that should do is actually read that service. Now this is a really nice no code way, right? You've seen some code so far. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I don't have a laptop though, sorry guys. <laughs> Hold on. So the other thing is uh, in terms of access. Now Access 2010 is kind of interesting in that what we can do, we actually can create this read only relationship with access with these backend data sources. So let's go first into my, uh, let me go here. And go into, let's grab one here. This is an old one. So this is basically what's installed on the client. You can't really see this too well, but there's just a bunch of XML files. There's this form region that Outlook uses. Here's the key thing here. There's this business data ca this cache. That is our offline client cache, okay? There is a security model around it, so you don't have to worry about exposing HR data on the client to folks, but there is some security around that. But the point is I can actually code against that, I can update that, and there's this BCS sync service. So I go down here and go to Task Manager, where we start Task Manager, and go to Process. This guy here, BCS Sync, that's that listener service. So I update something on the client, and I have this listener service that's spinning in the background, and the updates are gonna be pushed to my external data source, okay? leveraging the web services that I've built, all right? So I don't wanna end that process. We'll go in here and actually just go here. So I'll go back to access. I can go into external data, more data services, install a new connection. Uh, go in here, let's just, and go into metadata. It's gonna consume that application definition file or what we're now calling the ECT. Create a link table. And not only have I exposed data in Outlook, I have now exposed data and access. So imagine, this is pretty powerful, right? Now you have a reporting tool that you can pull into access or you can pull into Outlook, okay? You can also do this exposed it in SharePoint workspace, but I think uh, just for the sake of time, we'll move on. So um, where was I? So in terms of offlining, you saw that, let's go back here, I just clicked list and I can sync to SharePoint workspace or sync to connect to Outlook, that's gonna offline that list for me, okay? So jumping back to our PowerPoint, lovely PowerPoint. 
So again, external data, ECT, external list, you've seen those three. Let's talk a bit about APIs now. So now we've got this external list. How do I code against it, right? I'm a developer. I want to code. Show me the code. None of this no code option. I want to show the code. So there's different ways in which you can actually code against that list, right? Uh, and it's you know, ranges from these Office add-ins that I talked about before to WinForm or WPF or Silverlight, you know, different types of client apps that you can interact with that external data source. Uh, you can see here I've got a couple examples. This is just a screenshot that shows a custom task pane. It's grabbing some data from an external data source. It actually allows me to manage that data into Excel. Now, what does that mean? It means I don't have to recreate the formatting. I don't have to recreate the algorithms. I'm just leveraging what's there today in Excel. Uh, I can also do that with Outlook. So this is a nice WPF um, uh, example where we've got BCS data that's being pulled into um, an Outlook form region. Again, uh, another example here. This is really, this is my design skills. Pretty impressive, huh? <laughs> okay, I know, it's pretty sad. But uh, I'm not a designer. I don't profess to be one. But basically what this is, this is me using the BCS API on the client, which I'll talk about in just a sec, to grab some data from the offline entities, spin through, and leverage it in a WinForm app, which you would also equally do uh, in WPF. I'm not so much focusing on the design. I'm focusing on those core APIs that you can leverage, right? You guys are the designers and the developers, and you can uh, kind of take that to the next level. So Office, you know, you can also use OpenXML, Fluent UI. The Fluent UI is the ability to extend the ribbon, those sorts of things, uh, to uh, build some pretty interesting apps. All right, so a couple of APIs. This is a key API, uh, and you can see at the bottom there again, I'll post the slides. The SDK is actually out on MSDN today, so if you wanted to get in there and, and take a, a deeper look at uh, BCS SDK, you could. Basically walking through this, you have to set up an entry point when you're, building a, when you're coding against the BCS on the client. And that's essentially what I'm doing at the top. I'm using this remote SharePoint file or remote SharePoint file back metadata catalog object which just allows me to get in and grab the external content types that I've installed on the client, okay? Then I've got this get entities method, which is just saying, hey, get all the entities that I've offlined on the client so I can use them in some way, shape, or form. And then you can pretty much guess what's going on in my for each. I'm just iterating through and adding all those entries to a list box. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm allowing the user to select which one of those ECTs they want to you know, take, and then that's going to subsequently build out a, a data grid for me. Now, what if I wanted to update, right? If I wanted to update something on the client, again, there's this BCS API that I can leverage, OK? And this is where we're talking about increased richness with SharePoint 2010, with having tools, with having object model. You've seen the SharePoint designer in VS. Now you're being exposed to the object model. And what we have here is the fact that we have this thing called an entity instance reference, EIR. Now, this is actually pretty cool because what we can do is in our applications, we can actually embed a reference to our entity. And once we have that references, we can pull that reference back and call this materialized method, which is, hey, if I know the entity reference, pull it back. I don't have to worry about iterating through and finding all the different ECTs. I can use that specific method, right? And it's basically this thing is being held. I'll show you some code in a bit. But it's being held inside, and, and a reference is kind of hidden behind the scenes. And again, this is just going through and updating fields of a row in a data grid. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, update is basically saying, I'm going to update my client-side cache. That's what that update method is. And then basically, your client-side cache gets updated. And assuming you're online, and assuming your BCS listener service is actually spinning through, this gets added to the queue, and eventually we get persisted over to the server and update that backend data source. Pretty cool stuff, huh? <laughs> One guy said, eh. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, so creating a client-side solution. Let's look at a couple uh, simple examples. OK, so there's a couple of ways that we can, uh, we can interact with this stuff. So let's get rid of this guy. Let's go here. Uh, no, I want to change the, we'll leave that. And this guy here. Basically, what I've got here is a pretty simple form. Now, what I'm going to show you is the client object model, because there's two object models we can look at when we're interacting with these external data sources, right? One, I believe Mike Am is doing a talk tomorrow on the client object model. I would definitely check it out. Uh, he's going to give you a deep dive, 300 levels, so you'll learn all you need to learn 
Uh, but basically what, the, what is behind the scenes here is gonna be just a text box here. I enter in a link to my, my SharePoint site. I set the context, and basically when I hit load, what's gonna happen? It's gonna take that context and it's gonna populate the data from my external data source. Now the nice thing here is I don't necessarily need to use the BCS API. And what that means for a developer is I have options. Okay, it's the most important thing for a developer to have options, right? If one doesn't necessarily work the way you want it, you come around a different way, you find the way that works, all right? And what we've done here is basically I've created uh, just a string value, an IE enumerable, and a list collection. I don't know if you can all see that. Uh, and then I'm spinning through. I'm creating, you can see this client OM client context. So this is where the new API comes into play, all right? Now who can see Camel there? Anybody see Camel? Woo, come on, who likes camel here? One guy in the back going, I love it, I love camel. But basically what we're doing here is actually dynamically creating a camel query. Now it's a select all camel query, but the fact is we're dynamically creating it, right? So we're selecting the, we're, we're setting, setting the context, and we're going down here, we're saying client OM list collection, so I'm creating a list collection object, which is gonna go back and help me contain all the items in my list, and I'm getting my list by title, so this is one of my external data source lists or external lists that I've created. And basically I'm just dynamically creating this camel query and when it executes, you can see here it's gonna dynamically execute in my camel query. And this is the important thing here, right? This context execute query. Now what we'll do is actually get rid of this guy here because that is useless. We'll debug this and we'll uh, go into view, full screen, F5. I just wanna show you what the actual object looks like, okay? So we'll go into HTTP. BCS demo VM server. Let's try that typing. BCS demo VM server. We'll click load. That should stop. Okay. And if we go here, go into return data, results view. This is where it gets kind of interesting. I don't know if you can see this, but if we go into field values, there's a little BDC identity. This is kind of interesting. So each one of these entities has a little identity value, right? And you have to kind of work around that, but you can also create a reference using this identity. So you can actually program leveraging that identity. And what I've done here as we go down, you can see that I actually had to create an index for each one of these elements in the values. So I just went one, two, three, four, five, six, because I knew where it was, and I wanted those particular values. I iterated through my list collection object, populated that, and I just basically data bound that to my data grid. So if we click F5, Where's my F lock here? There we go. F five. Basically, what happens is that data that data grids get populated. So very simply, I'm using client object model to interact with my uh, with my external data source. Now that's one option. There's another option here. I'll show you. And uh, this is more along the lines of an Office app. And you can see here I've got this design here where remember the APIs I actually showed you on my slides. I'm basically just implementing those APIs. So instead of using the client object model, in this case, I'm using the new BCS API, okay? So if you look behind the scenes, what I've got here is I've got some references that I need to actually add in here. These are all the new references. The DLs would be business data. Let me just pull that over a little bit. Business data, business applications runtime, and office.business data. And then you can see, I'm not gonna walk through all of this code. Again, I'll just post this so you can take a look at it. You can see that basically, I am doing the, I'm leveraging that same code I showed you in the slides. I'm creating this catalog object, I'm spinning through, you know, adding all the items to a list box, allowing the user to actually select the list box, so which one they want, and then I'll implement the uh, update method if they do anything. So in this case, what we should see is this will actually create a Word document. This is my add-in, and I have this custom task pane that's actually positioned along the top of the document. And this is the interesting thing about actions panes, you can put them anywhere you want. I've put them up here so it's loaded. And this is the PDC test two that we took offline. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna click customer and sales data. Load this, and basically what we can do then is actually leverage the objects within our office document. Here we've got, you know, John, Do John Jamie Donahue three, and we'll update that. And what I just did, I called that update method. Remember I had that update method in code? And that now, is taking my data here and actually updating my client side cache, okay? Now how we prove that, making sure that it actually works, is going back 
and F5ing it because what will happen, it's loading that data again. So theoretically, it should load the data that I actually just updated, okay? And I have to click F5 though for that to work. Any questions while this is loading? How do I deploy? Uh, the Great question. And I, I have a slide on deployment. And you'll see there, once we click customer and sales data, uh, not sure what happened there, but it should have updated. Trust me, it updated this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very powerful stuff. So those are two examples. I've got eight minutes left here, so we have to cruise just a little bit forward. Uh, creating a client side. So we've basically walked the process. External data, ECT, external list. I showed you that. We offline that list. I showed you two examples of APIs, one that is native to BCS, the new 2010 API, one that is new to the client object model, so a little more generic to SharePoint. Both those allow you to interact with the external data source in different ways. Deployment and security, so getting to your question. Deployment, so how do I deploy this stuff? On the client side, obviously if you're creating a WinForm or a WPF app, you could use MSIs or click once. Typically if you use a word add-in, you would use click once and basically you right click on the project, publish it to a particular location. It creates all the files for you that someone should just go to and click set up BXE and then would drop it on their local, uh, local client. Now the nice thing about VSTO uh, in the current Office version, for those of you who have built VSTO apps before, uh, the runtime actually ships with Office which is huge. You don't need privileges, admin privileges actually deploy click once or deploy the, uh, the actual application. It's uh, elevated privileges that are already taken care of for you. You don't have to do it. So server side though. So two methods that we talked about server side was if I build using SharePoint Designer, it's actually deploying that XML file into the metadata store. Okay, that's the one way. But if we deploy it using VS, it's creating a WSP. It's creating a package, features. And again, very, very rich. Okay, because you can do lots of stuff with that. Security, we can pass through, revert to self, single sign-in is three different ways of actually interacting with that back-end system. You can imagine the client will have a modified uh, version of the, the uh, SSS that lives on the server, and you can also leverage other different types of security. I believe there was a security talk yesterday that Venki did. He talked a lot about this stuff, so for a little deeper reference on this, you can check out his talk. I really want to bring it all together here and show you one more demo, because this is interesting, <clears throat> brings together some interesting stuff. So let's go back here. And this is uh, basically what I've done here, is built a demo where we've got SAP. Okay, now I'm beyond my little custom service that was interacting with AdventureWorks. I have SAP, I'm gonna click Purchasing. This is gonna go out and grab SAP data, it's gonna pull it in, and it's gonna bind it to a Silverlight application, okay? Then what it's gonna do, it's gonna allow me to kind of filter on that application. So here is SAP data in Silverlight in SharePoint, okay? It's got some nice dynamic experiences. If I click on value, I can go ahead and, and rev that up and down. You can see it changes the values that appear in my Silverlight application, okay? Very cool stuff, right? Because when you think about things like NetWeaver and other types of uh, entry points into SAP, this changes the game. Now the second point here is if we look down here to my right, the other thing I've got is an aggregated data source. Now remember what I told you when we first started out? You have to design a, a seamless experience for your user. They don't care where this data is coming from, they just wanna do their job, right? And so in this case, I've got SAP data along the top and I have a second data source coming in that allows me to do some vendor rating. So basically what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to create a statement of work. And so I can do that with SAP data and vendor rating data. Okay, very cool stuff, all in the context of Silverlight embedded, and basically the APIs that I'm using here, I'm using the client object model that I showed you, and I'm using BCS API on the client, so those ones I showed you are a little more fancy, a little more kind of nice and revved up, and if we go and take a look at the client side document, uh, basically, let's go down here, if I go into documents, uh, I have this document library, I go into document types, I've actually got a content type that I've actually mapped as a custom template that's leveraging BCS API, okay? And so I click SOW template, that spawns this guy right here, which is a nice WPF-based experience. It's kind of ugly and yellow, I know, but it's <laughs> it would be nice if you guys did it, right? <laughs> and so we have the ability to do a little search uh, when I get my mouse back. There we go. 
and I can insert that information. Again, just like I showed you with that WinForm app, it takes data, it puts it and binds it with those word content controls. And then what I can do is I can go down and I can create a PO. That's going to spawn a little app. And this is where I'm actually writing back into my external data source. And I'll go here, just say six, submit. That's actually going to take that data. And now I'm calling that put. But I'm calling the put against SAP in this case. And it's putting data back into SAP from within my office document using BCS. And here you go. For those of you, I don't know if there's any ABAP coders in the crowd. But you can see here that these are typical ABAP messages coming back from SAP that are like, hey, yes, successful, you know, successful put uh, back into SAP. Now, just really, really quickly, I'll show you uh, the projects. And again, if you really, really want this, ping me offline. I'll probably post this in the next few months, a couple months probably, maybe the new year. But if this is something like you really want to get your teeth into, let me know. Because there's some really cool code in here that we're working on. And you can see here that to define just one couple things, I'm using the client object model here in my Silverlight app to interact with that external data source to read it in. That's one thing I wanted to show you. And I already showed you this code before. You can see the dynamic camel query being generated and the list items to kind of contain that data coming back. And here, I'm using the VS business data connectivity model. You can see here, this is where we begin to understand. I don't know if you can see, I've got two web services, both those reaching out into SAP. OK, and if you look at my business data model, let's go over here and open up the BD, BDCM. And the funny thing is when you actually go into your bin debug and you actually open up this file in, in uh, Notepad, guess what? It's the ECT, right? You're coding it into the ECT in Visual Studio. You just get all sorts of stuff that you can get with uh, .NET. And you can see here, I've got a read list, I've got a read item, and a create item. Pretty cool stuff, huh? So again, to kind of wrap that back up and bring it back around where we started, I created a custom service in this case too, except this time, instead of the AdventureWorks backend, it was SAP as my backend. And I walked through that process of creating those web services and I just exposed them to VS. And I could build more and more if I wanted to my VS project, but therein uh, kind of is our connection back to where we started. Okay? So that said, I've got 119 left. Woo! Cutting it down to the wire. Summary. Office business applications, I think, can leverage BCS, I think, in very strong ways. You saw server, you saw client, nice symmetrical ways to tie those two together. Uh, you know, facilitate uh, Office and or SharePoint integrations with these external data sources or lob systems. Um, I think, you know, BCS is a huge evolution forward from the BDC, huge. You can still get the BDC web parts if you want in 2010. So if you love that, you like the read-only experience, you still have it. But BCS allows you some pretty cool read-write capabilities. Uh, again, you saw a couple of different ways of interacting with that data. You don't have to stick to the BCS API if you don't want to. You can use other ways. I would encourage you to check out Mike's talk if you want to learn more about client object model. He's going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, core pieces of BCS is the ECT, as we talked about. And I think the thing I like about the BCS is you can take it offline. You have both code options and no code options. So if you want to get something up and running really quickly, you can do it. It can be an external list, it can be access, it can be SharePoint workspace, it could be Outlook, but you've got options not only from a developer's perspective, from the APIs and the no code, but you've got options from an end user perspective, which is always really nice, okay? And that said, I've got basically maybe a couple questions here. Any questions on that? Yes, sir? Oh, that's a great question. So, you remember in, the question was, is that available in SharePoint? Probably what SKU is that available in was probably the question. But remember in 2007, I had to buy the enterprise SKU in order to get BDC? Uh-uh. This is available in SharePoint Foundation. Yeah. Woo! SharePoint Foundation. Yeah, so that's great. So um, out of the box, you don't have to any, yeah? Yes. And you select the object type, or SharePoint object type. Select, uh, they're listed in the announcements, document libraries, and so on. Yep. If I want to use a particular it's, um, contact list that I build with my own fields or columns, can I select my contact list? You would, do that in, you would do that in the Visual Studio project. The question was, if I had a custom object that I've created, where would I do it? I would do it in Visual Studio, because that way you can map 
the two. So what I'll do is I'm going to go down to the booth. If you want to come down there for questions, great. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time, folks. Appreciate it.